Welcome back to The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. In the last part we did a lot of plot and side stuff. In this part we're going to be re-entering the Temple of Time because Sheik has some new stuff to say to us. This only occurs after you've beat the Forest Temple, and only if you've beat the Forest Temple. Not the Forest Temple only, but... What I'm trying to say is that, say you go to the Fire Temple first and you decide to beat that. I don't think Sheik will trigger this cutscene. It has to be the forest temple that has been beaten. And you totally can go to the fire temple and beat that one first without having set foot in the forest temple. But that's, that's getting into something that I'm going to talk about later. Now, Sheik is telling us that we can actually travel through time. If we place the Master Sword back in its pedestal, then we'll actually revert to Child Link. And we're going to be doing that in this part because it's pretty important for the purposes of actually a lot of stuff we actually need to do that in order to progress unless you have like so much of the game memorized that you don't need it but I'm gonna do it anyway Sheik's teaching us the prelude of light a prelude is kind of a introductory song which is weird for a couple of reasons considering that we have to get this one after getting another song and that we can't get this one until after we've already beat a dungeon so it's weird to me, but whatever. Prelude, it's an introductory song. Kind of gives it away by using the word, or the prefix pre, which kind of means like before. Anyway. Now that we know this song, we can warp to the Temple of Time whenever we desire. Except when the game doesn't want us to. And Sheik is going to disappear, as usual. For now, though, we're actually going to do what Sheik is telling us to do. We'll put the Master Sword back in the pedestal and revert to when we were a child. It's all fancy and such. Luckily for us, once we turn back into a child, our inventory stays pretty much the same. So, in terms of hearts, in terms of stuff in bottles, it's the same throughout time. Even though we technically didn't collect those hearts as a child, but whatever. We got stuff to do now. Lots of side questing and main questing, so let's get her done. First off, we're gonna go to Kakariko Village because we learned a specific song from a specific person that told us that a kid came to this village and played a song in the windmill and then he memorized that song and played it forever. In fact, he's playing it right now, which is weird because if you hate the song, then why would you play it? And also, this is before he learned that he hate the song. This is before he even learned the song, so whatever. We're gonna play the song, and it's gonna make this windmill spin like crazy. It's the Song of Storms. Everyone's favorite song. No contest. Now that we've played it, of course the windmill will, I don't know, rev up for some reason. I guess since we caused a storm that includes wind, and thus the windmill goes a lot faster. So it's going to drain the water from the well. Although I'm not sure how it's connected to the well. In Ocarina of Time 3D, there are actually some posters around a lot of the places that teach you about some things. And one of those things is there's a poster around in the windmill that actually shows a little diagram of like the windmill draining water from the well or something like that. Now that the well is drained though, we can go inside. We can actually go inside as an adult as well, but there's not really much reason to, and you're actually blocked off at the very entrance because, well first there's like this big kind of wall of bones and stuff I think, or maybe it's just caved in, but then there's this crawly hole and only young Link can crawl through holes for some reason. I mean, adult Link is bigger of course, but whatever. This place has a lot of not good stuff in it. It looks like there's blood splattered on the walls. There's skeletons everywhere that Navi can communicate with for some reason. And there's a lot of fake stuff going on. For example, this wall. We can just waltz right through it. And that is going to be like a theme for the dungeon that's associated with this place. The ice cavern was associated with the water temple. There's going to be another temple that's kind of, you know, in line with this one. What we need to do 
is we need to play Zelda's Lullaby at this Triforce, because that's obviously what you do at Triforces, and it will drain the water. Kind of a tutorial for the next dungeon that we're going to be doing, actually. Pretty interesting, but this dungeon is really short. It's like the miniest mini dungeon ever. Actually, it's more like it can be as short or as long as you want it to be. Because we're going to be getting the dungeon item and then leaving. There's not really any heart container to be gained. There's a lot of gold sculptulas and a lot of rooms to visit and such. And it has like a compass and a map, I think. But we're not going to be dealing with those things because, well, I don't have to. This place is scary enough as it is. And look at this. There's hands coming out of the ground, and if one of them grabs you, the boss will actually come out. This, I think his name is Dead Hand, and he is frightening. At least I think so. He has, like, blood all over him, his face is freaky, and it, the only way to damage this boss is you need to let those hands capture you, and then he will come out of the ground from somewhere, randomly, and then he'll try to come close to you and bite you. You can get out of the hands pretty easily, you just kind of like have to spam some buttons. But once you do, try to get to him as fast as you can, and you also want to wait until he's completely underground in order to attack him. Because if he's not, then the hand will just grab you and kind of do nothing. The hands actually don't damage you, but it's still pretty freaky. Another thing that can damage you in this boss fight is him actually going underground. There's like bits of debris that fly around as he digs down. If you get hit by them, then you'll actually take damage. But he's done, and he drops magic like other kind of dead creatures, like re-deads and such. And his corpse just kind of flops over near you, and it takes a little while to disappear. Kind of like with re-deads, I suppose. But now that we've beat him, we can get the dungeon item and leave this place immediately. The fastest way to do it would actually be to play like a warp song or something, but I'm kinda dumb and I don't do that. Instead I leave the normal way. With the lens of truth we can see the unseen. Invisible walls will no longer be invisible to us. Or rather, no that's wrong. Fake walls will no longer be visible. Instead we can just waltz right through them. I mean we can without the lens, but we'll know whether or not it's fake. And also there's fake floors and such too. And some enemies are actually invisible. You don't really need the lens of truth to beat the game. There's a lot of like... How should I put it? You could do a lot of trial and error or try to memorize stuff instead. And that can, you know, get you to the end pretty normally. Although it will probably take longer. But you don't actually need it is what I'm trying to say. Plus, there are usually some telling signs when something's fake. For example, when we entered that, you know, fake wall over there, there was the, uh, the two pots in front of it that kind of gave away that it wasn't a real wall. And after all that about me not warping to the Temple of Time, I end up doing it anyway. This is to actually get a piece of heart. There's a mini game in the market that's only open at night. And if you go inside, then you can talk to this guy and pay 10 rupees to play a minigame. This minigame was kind of hinted at in one of the Sheikah stones that's near the, uh, the Temple of Time. It said that it's illegal to use, like, glasses when you're doing the, uh, the treasure chest shop minigame. And the reason why is because if we use the Lens of Truth, we can see the contents of these chests. And, you know, either it's a rupee, Depending on the room, it would be like a blue ruby in this room, and the previous two is green. Or a key. This key will allow you to progress through the rooms. And as long as you keep getting keys, you can keep progressing. With the Lens of Truth, if you just kind of flicker it on and off, it will save magic. Because like it takes a little while for it to count as taking up magic. So if you just keep flickering it, it won't, you know, it won't reduce your magic meter any. And after going through enough rooms, you can get the final prize. You can actually you can actually use the Lens of Truth to figure out what the prize is before even opening the box, but it's a piece of heart. 
sadly, once the minigame ends, you can't really just like, you know, leave. You can't warp because we can't use our ocarina. And they don't warp you back to the entrance, like to ask you if you want to play again because the game doesn't want to be convenient or anything. But it's fine. We can just walk out on our own. If you talk to the guy, he'll say something like, Oh, you're really good at gambling or something like that, which of course we aren't because we're cheaters. But now that that's done, we're going to be making our way to Zora's River because there's another side quest that we can do over there. This side quest has to do with some frogs on a log, or at least a fallen tree. We need to make our way a little bit far in Zora's River, around where the first heart piece you can obtain here is. And after that, we need to step on that log and talk to the frogs, or at least play some ocarina songs for the frogs, because the way this side quest works is that you step on the log and then you pull out your ocarina and the frogs will jump out. Each frog is associated with a button on the ocarina, or at least a button on your controller, a note on the ocarina. We don't need this cocoa anymore, get out of here. Once you step on this and take out your ocarina, frogs jump out, you play a song for them and they give you some money. You can only play the uh, the non-warping songs, I believe. Those are the only songs they accept, and those are the only songs they'll give you money for. Those songs are Zelda's Lullaby, Saria's Song, Epona's Song, The Song of Time, The Song of Storms, and The Sun Song. Once you play all of them for those frogs, then they'll all grow into big frogs, and they'll give you 50 rupees for each one. I am pretty full on rupees, so I kind of don't need any, but, you know, it's nice to have nonetheless, and I kind of want to get the side quest out of the way quickly, because it's actually not a very fun side quest. At least the second part of it is. As you keep playing for them, they'll keep growing bigger, and then after that, you play one final song for them, and they'll just kind of be happy, I guess. You cannot do this as an adult, they do not appear while you're adult Link and standing on the log. At least, I don't think they do. I'm pretty sure they don't. So just take my word for it. This is a bit of a time-consuming quest. Actually, it's a really time-consuming quest. But at the end of it, you do get a nice haul of things. You get 250 rupees in all for playing five songs. Then the sixth song, you'll get a piece of heart. And then they'll have a minigame for you that is very difficult very not fun and that also leads you to another piece of heart and then after that if you play the minigame again you'll probably get like rupees or something this is the second of the heart pieces is probably the one i always forget about but the reason why is probably because i'm trying to block it out of my memory considering that i think it's one of the worst minigames in the zelda series it takes memorization some precision and some speed and you also have to be on a tempo too and I like to think that I'm not that bad when it comes to music in fact I can play a couple of instruments but this minigame is just such a chore to me that I I don't know I just don't like doing it and I don't like reminding myself that I have to do it so I just don't now that we have played this final song all the frogs are large, everyone's all happy, we get a piece of heart. Now, we're going to initiate another minigame. This minigame requires you to press these buttons in this specific order. A, C left, C right, C down, C left, C right, C down, A, C down, A, C down, C right, C left, A. If you press those buttons in the precise order, on tempo, you can't be slow, you will get a second piece of heart. That is not a good time. You do not want to play that minigame. I would be fine if you don't want to get all the heart pieces because of that minigame. Although I just told you the order, so you probably wouldn't have much of a problem with it. But as you saw, I made an edit because it took me two in-game days to get the order down and to figure out how to do it because I don't like using guides. I like to do things by myself and I get that that's pretty stubborn but still 
I shouldn't have to take two in-game days in order to figure that out. But now that that's done, I'll actually use the Prelude of Light to warp back to the Temple of Time because I want to become an adult again. I need to do that to get some other, like, heart pieces and such. Well, one other heart piece, and to show off a glitch that's actually very useful and very easy to do in my opinion. Alright, now that we're back at the Temple of Time, we can go pick up the Master Sword and go back to the future. Let's do the time warp again. Other famous time stuff, references, whatever. You know, now that I think about it, maybe we should actually stay in the past. I mean, Ganondorf can't get the Triforce if we don't pick up the Master Sword, right? Right? Whatever. Now that we're here, we're not actually going to do some edit warping. We're going to be walking out into the market because I want to show off our brand new sword. The Begoron Sword is better than the Master Sword in some aspects and kind of worse in others. The main thing about it is that it does double damage than the Master Sword. So like four times the damage of the Kokiri Sword. That's pretty good. The sucky thing about the Begoron Sword is that it requires two hands to use. So you can't use your shield while having the sword out. You can kind of do this fake block thing where you kind of hold it up in front of you. But that doesn't... it doesn't really do anything. And you could also kind of crouch, like just sit on the floor. Not really sit, just like squat. And it's for like getting underneath those spinning blades like in the ice cavern or whatever. Again, it's not that useful, but I do feel like all those problems are, you know, taken away once you count that it does double damage than the Master Sword. Like, these Redeads are going down in two hits, one jump attack. I mean, you kind of can do that with one jump attack from the Master Sword if you, like, hit them with the start and end of the animation of the jump attack, which technically does two hits, but... Now I'm showing off something else, something very creepy. The Redeads will ignore you if they see another dead Redead nearby. They'll kind of just walk over to it and stand near it and kind of do nothing until the body disappears. And I'm just going to leave him to his devices because that is some scary... Anyway, we're going to be walking out because Epon is outside waiting for us and I actually just walked through her, whatever. It's faster to take her to where I'm going to go because obviously it's faster to ride a horse than to run. Unless you're like, well, never mind. This tree over here is a very specific tree and a very, a very important tree because if you have the Shard of Agni on, which I do but don't because I don't like having vibration on my controllers and I already have everything memorized so I might as well do this anyway. You can place a bomb at this tree and doing so will reveal a secret grotto. In this secret grotto there is a blue tech type. And again I'm going to be showing off how awesome the Vigoron sword is because blue tech types take more damage than uh, red ones. They take two swings from the master sword. But just one from the Bigoron Sword, which is why it's better than the Master Sword in every aspect. It's just faster. You're trading, I don't know, tankiness and defense for pure range and offense, and I just, I dig that. Anyway, you could go underwater here and grab yourself another piece of heart. You need the Iron Boots in order to get it. If you try to do it with, like, the Golden Scale, I don't think it works. As for the glitch that I said I was going to show off, I think the easiest place and the place where I get to show off something new is the graveyard. If you go to the, the cave or the grotto underneath a grave that had the Hylian shield in it and you bomb the back, there's actually a furry fountain behind there. And if you have an empty bottle and say an item that you don't want anymore, so we're going to use the claim check because 
We don't really have a use for it any longer. We already got the item that was required. If you try to scoop up a fairy with a bottle and fail horribly like I'm about to do, you'll catch the fairy in the bottle, but something else will happen. I'm going to let out this fairy because I screwed up because I suck. Anyway. Alright, enough joking around. Now I'm actually going to do it. What you want to do is you want to pause the game mid-animation as you're trying to scoop something up. Then switch out to whatever the perishable item is. Then whatever you have scooped up becomes whatever the perishable item was. So now, instead of having just three bottles and the claim check, I have four bottles. And I don't want to do the fourth bottle side quest, so I'm just going to say that we did it and got this fourth bottle. And that's that. Next time on The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, we'll be going to the next temple.